God's word to you today. How many of you have heard of this new little thing? Uh, you've heard of it or, or use it, this new little thing called the internet? It's all the craze these days, I hear. Uh, uh, I don't know how much you know about the internet, but there's a couple of symbols that I want to inter- introduce you to this morning. One is this symbol right here. Uh, some people call it the hamburger symbol, right? Kind of looks like a hamburger. And what happens with this symbol and with the drop-down arrow that I, I think we're going to show is if you click on those things, what happens is that your options sort of expand, right? Like it's the menu button, it's the drop down button, you click on it, your options expand, and you have all these other options, all these other opportunities of things to go, places to go, people to see, right? So put that in your pocket, I'll come right back to that. Um, If you're, maybe you've processed this, maybe you haven't, but we're in the middle of what we call in the church the season of Lent. It is the, the time leading up from Ash Wednesday, which was February the 14th this year, until... Easter, which is April 1st, which is about 27 days away. And this time is called the season of Lent. It's where Christians really focus in on the story uh, of Easter. What happens, though, uh, well, unfortunately what happens sometimes is that um, Palm Sunday is this Sunday right before Easter. It's where the church celebrates uh, Jesus' triumphal entry into, into Jerusalem, where he's going to be crucified. And unfortunately, what happens is, if we just sort of take a, the Palm Sunday and the Easter bookends, uh, oftentimes we, only lim- we limit ourselves to only a couple of Sundays to actually really unpack the Easter story. Now, um, for all you math nerds in the room, um, the, this time frame between Palm Sunday and Easter, the gospel writers, by the gospel writers, I mean Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, uh, they they write, about 30% of their writing is about this one-week time frame. So 30% of the gospel writings, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John, is about this week between Palm Sunday and Easter. Uh, If you are a math nerd and you did a little math, you will discover that this 30% covers about 5% of 1% of Jesus' life. And yet they wrote 30% of their gospel writings about this 5% of a 1% of of Jesus' life. And that is because of what happens in this week is absolutely so important. It's so uh, crucial. And so what I want us to do for the next five weeks is I want us to expand the menu, right? I want us to look at that week and and really unpack some of the things that take place in that week's time over the next five weeks or so. Um, Let me give you a little more specific about about how we're going to do this. Uh, Anybody ever heard of Twitter, right? We've we've heard of Twitter. Uh, Everybody and their brother seems to be tweeting these days, right? Uh, All the way from the President of the United States to to movie stars to musicians, everybody's tweeting. And uh, honestly, let's just be honest, some people should stay off of Twitter, all right? I'm just going to throw that out there. Some people would be better off if they just actually stayed off of Twitter. But Twitter, uh, in its sort of purest form, is this way to, to capture, to tweet, to uh, sort of get out there in the social media wor- world these pithy statements, these profound statements, these iconic ideas that, um, that we really think should be memorable or, or should be, um, you know, dispersed for the world to know. So what we're going to do over the next five weeks is we are going to look at some very iconic statements that take place between Palm Sunday and Easter. There's some things, some some very iconic statements that, that are said in this moment that I am convinced had there been a Twitter when Jesus was around, people would have been tweeting this stuff. Statements like, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Statements like Jesus made to Peter when he says, uh, Peter, before the, the rooster crows three times, you're going to deny me twice. Uh, statements like the centurion made when he's standing at the foot of the cross and Jesus has just died and he says, surely this was the Son of God. These statements that take place between Palm Sunday 
and Easter, these, these iconic statements that, that really speak depth and truth into our life. This is where we're going to spend the next five weeks. Now, um, let me just clarify the, the one that I'm going to share with you today. There is some discrepancy where this statement uh, may fall because the, the gospel writer Luke, he places it in Luke chapter 13, a few pages before Jesus' triumphal entry, while the gospel writer Matthew places it in chapter 23, which is a few pages after he records the, the triumphal entry. And, and a lot of people, Bible scholars would say, it, it may be possible that... Th- Possibly that, that the reason why the gospel writers put it in different places is it, not because there, dis, there is a discrepancy, because this is a statement that Jesus may have said often. But, but here is the statement, and it is a statement that has really just rung in my heart, uh, even ever since I was a kid, honestly. Ever since I was a kid, this statement has, has really just resonated with me. Jesus is there, and he says, Oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem. I would have, I have longed to gather your children like a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not let me. But now your house is abandoned and you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The statement, oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem. And I want us to unpack a little bit of what Jesus is saying in this moment. When he says, oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem. Um, What I begin to, to see and understand is that Jesus in this moment, his heart is breaking for this people. He says, oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem. Uh, let me just unpack that a little bit. Um, I sometimes get exclamation point happy. All right. Like, I text people. In fact, I, I'd sent Pastor Emily a text a, a couple weeks ago, or maybe less than that, I don't know. And at the end of the text, I looked back at what I had sent her, and I said, oh, by the way, uh, I like exclamation points. I mean, he's like, you know, exclamation point, exclamation point. Uh, you know, sometimes I do that on purpose. Like, when I send the text to Amy, and I just really want her to know how much I really, really love her, and I'll say, I love you, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. I want her to know exactly how I feel about her, that there's this great amount of love for her, so I just put all kinds of exclamation points at the end. Now, for, for those of us who have studied the Greek language a little bit, we realize that um, the, the Greek language does not have exclamation points. That, that really an exclamation point is not something that the Greek language utilized. What they would often do is they would often repeat a word to, to show the same sort of emphasis. And so in this moment when Jesus is saying, oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, he is making a point of emphasis that his heart is breaking for this people. His heart is breaking for this people, this people that has killed the prophets over and over and over again. He says, oh, Jerusalem. For the Hebrew mind, this, this phrase, oh, Jerusalem, it was sort of representative of, of God's people. But, but even more than that, as we look back on the Old Testament writings, the, the history of this Jewish people, we see that time and time again, there have been other people, not even within the, the Jewish faith, these god fears, people like Rahab, and people like Ruth and others who had really become a part of God's people because they honored and respected and walked in obedience to God. And so when he says, oh, Jerusalem, he is talking about God's people, this people that God had longed to reconcile himself to over and over again. And he had sent prophets, he had sent messengers, and they had killed him. And his heart is breaking for them. This is the city. This is the city that he is interacted with, that he has walked in and out of their villages, in and out of their streets, and, and he has he's interacted with them, and he realizes, he realizes that they have rejected him, and as a result, they have not been living the life that he had offered for them, and his heart is breaking for them. It, it makes me ask the question, has my heart really broke for the people in our community who have, who have not been living the life that God has for them. They have walked away from him. They have rejected him. And have as my heart broke for them so much that I'd be willing to say, oh, Marion, 
Oh, Mary, oh, Grant County, God longs to gather you as a, as a hen gathers her chick, but you would not. As I walk in and out of its streets, as I go in and out of its, its byways, it's, it's off the, the main path roads, and I see people walking, I see people getting in and out of their cars, does my heart break for them? This is, this is what is taking place. This is the big picture idea. Jesus' heart is breaking for them because they are not living the life that he has for them. And he says, oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem. I would have longed to have gathered you. See, see, their rejection of God was costing them something. It, it was costing them something. And he said, I, I would have loved to have brought you in, to have protected you like a like a." Like a hen gathers her chicks. Now, um, the reality is, I don't know if you, how many of you actually have chickens. Maybe some of you have chickens. I don't have any chickens. And don't tell my wife we need chickens because that will be a bad idea. But, um, but thankfully, we do have YouTube, right? So we can watch chickens and anything else we want to watch, right? So um, I was thinking, what is this imagery? What is this very vibrant imagery that Jesus is speaking of. Let's watch. I think we should cheer for the chickens, right? When they actually make it happen. They're all going to make it, I think. You can do it. Come on. Oh, it's a win. Yeah. That's awesome. You're really bored. There's things on YouTube like this you can watch. Um, what Jesus uses is an imagery that's different than the imagery that a lot of us associate when we think about God. Jesus uses an imagery of a hen protecting her young, a hen that, that protects, that loves, that um, watches over, that brings warmth to. This is the imagery that, that Jesus uses about what he longs to do in the life of, of this people. Oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem. It's a very different imagery than most of us think about when we think about God, at least some of us. We, we have a tendency to think more of, of God like a cosmic bully. Like a cosmic bully that is just waiting to catch us doing something wrong so he can whack us on the head. But, but Jesus, he casts a very different imagery in this passage of Scripture. He casts this imagery of this, of this hen that would love to have gathered her chicks under her wing. Our hearts should break for people who are not experiencing the life that God longs for them to have. They're not experiencing hope in their life. They're not experiencing the healing that he longs for broken relationships within their lives. They're not experiencing, they're not experiencing this redemption story that he wants to bring about. Our hearts should break for them. Jesus' heart breaks for them. And not only does his heart break for them because they are not experiencing the life that, um, that they could be experiencing, but he does know. He does know that as a result of their rejecting God, as a result of them not uh, just surrendering their life to God, uh, there would be consequences as well. He says, your house now lays abandoned. Uh, some would some Bible scholars would suggest that, that maybe what Jesus is pushing in on there is the fact that in about 70 AD, the Jewish temple would be destroyed. And, 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 and so he is saying there is consequences. There is consequences for your, um, for your rejection and your walking away from me. 
I think maybe even we, under, we misunderstand a little bit of the consequences that, that maybe he is pushing in on here. Sometimes we think that the consequences that God allows to come into our path, he, he allows out of retribution. Like, like it's sort of payback for not doing what he wants us to do. But many times these consequences are a result of us not living the life he actually offers us. So, so we make bad decisions, not God-led decisions of, about how we live in relationship with others and our relationships fall apart. We make decisions about how we just live our lives and, and as a result there are these consequences and there seems to possibly be these moments when God even lifts his, his, his protection his, his hand of mercy upon us, and he allows us to experience the full frontal of, uh, the, the effect of what our life is, is bringing about. And his heart is still breaking for them. He said, oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem. This is a group of people that had killed prophet after prophet. Uh, if, there was any, if there was any thought I mean, God could have been angry at them. But God is still pursuing. God is still pursuing. I, I, I'm not the English prof. I'm just married to the English prof, the English teacher. But, but I did notice that both of these words were plural. Jerusalem, who has killed the prophets, who has killed God's messengers, these are plural because if you look at the history, God continually did this, right? He would send them a messenger. He would send them a prophet, and they would kill them. And, and a little bit later, what would God do? He would send them another messenger. He would send them another prophet, and they would kill him. And what would God do? God would send them another prophet. God would send them another messenger, and they would kill him. And God just keeps doing it. Because God's love for this people is so much. He's willing to sacrifice. And ultimately, he says, I will send my son. Recently, I, um, I was able to watch the movie 12 Strong. I don't know if you saw that it's a military movie. And it, it, it just reminded me of a lot of military movies I've seen where these moments when soldiers have this group of people that they are wanting to free. This, this community, uh, 12 Strong was about going into Afghanistan and, and freeing some, um, some cities that were under the Taliban rule. And these soldiers would go, and, and, and soldiers from, from, the, from, from Afghanistan as well would go, and they would make their approach on these cities to free them. And there would be strongholds there, and, and their bullets would fly, and soldiers would die, and more soldiers would, more soldiers would just come. Because their love for the people was so great, and they had a mission. They loved the mission that they were called to, and they would just keep coming. Can I say this is the type of God that is pursuing us? This is the God that is pursuing us. And what happens is, is just because we reject God, just because we hold God at a distance, doesn't keep him from pursuing us. Why? Because he longs to reconcile us to the Father. He longs for us to live the life that he offers us. He longs for us to experience what it is to experience him, not as a cosmic bully that is waiting to, to beat us over the head every time we do something wrong, but he's waiting us to experience him as a loving hen gathers her chicks under his wings, her wings. And yet so many times, like Jerusalem, we will not let him. Can I tell you today, if you have been rejecting God, if you've been running from God, maybe it's a big picture run from God, you want nothing to do with God, or maybe it's been running from God from a little part of, of, of your life, something he's asking you to do. Um, 
by running from God, that has not kept you, that has not kept him from pursuing you. But can I tell you, it is also costing you the life that he wants you to live. It's costing you the life that he wants you to live. It's costing you the healing and the forgiveness that, that, that he wants you to experience. So today, I'm going to have a very open, a very open uh, response time. It is, I, I usually don't like to open them up this wide, but here is the response. If you're here today and you say, you know what, Pastor Tony, there have been some areas of my life that I have been running from God, and frankly, I have seen the results of, of, of not living the life that God truly has for me. I've experienced consequences, the natural consequences. I, I, I've just, I've not experienced that love that he longs for me to have. And you've been running from God. I want to I say, you know what? He's still pursuing you. And he longs to gather you under his wings. Not as a cosmic bully, but as a hen gathers her chicks. Here's the other half. If you're here and, and you there's someone in your life that your heart is just breaking for because you want them to come to know Jesus Christ so bad. And you just want to bring them to the altar and say, God, break my heart for them more. God, break my heart for them more. May I see them as you see them. May I be willing to sacrifice. May I be willing to do whatever it takes to reach them. Or or maybe you're here and you just want your heart to be broken more for the 40,000 people in Grant County who do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, who have no religious affiliation. And you say, God, just...